Jimi Hendrix had decided to buy this club in the basement of this building that he used to go to all the time. I think he did because the bar bill was too big that he had run up. I'm not sure if that's true. So he buys the club, and, and now comes the, the, that little lightning flash tells his manager to find out who designed this little club in Soho and have him design my club. So I get a call one day from, from Jimmy's manager, which was quite surprising for a 22-year-old beginning person just starting out on my life in New York City. Of course, very excited. I'm not a guitar player, but like everybody I imagine in this room was a pretty big fan of Jimmy's. So that was very exciting. So we designed a club for him. This is the only drawing I have of the club. That's the club that he visited. Well, that's just an image of it. It became famous, cover of Life magazine. And that's the only picture drawing I could find of the club. And in the basement, going downstairs, curved walls, Jimmy wanted no straight lines. Everything had to be curved and changing lights and a stage that revolved. And part of his idea was that in the back of the club, he'd have a small recording room. He was very ahead of his time, really. And uh, it was an interesting idea which at the last minute got changed. At the last minute, the club gets scrapped. Eddie Kramer takes my dreams away from me because I thought I'm going to get this club built and changes it to a studio because Eddie didn't care about the club. He wanted a studio. He had just come over from London. So he convinces Jimmy to make it a studio. In fact, convinces him to build his own studio, which was unheard of. And the project switches. Somehow they don't fire me. In fact, they say, why don't you just stay on and try and do it? I quit my job. I became an intern for free, working for an acoustician who did radio stations so I could learn about the detailing of isolation walls. It was the only way I could learn about it fast. And uh, we set out to design the studio. This kind of design got transformed into that. And that's more or less what it looks like today, except the control room has changed. You came down a stair from the street. There was, there was no street, just a tiny little thing on the street, lobby, and you big, big, uh, studio room, about 30 by 40, 35 by 45. Pretty big control room, although the shape is a little goofy. It was, big, it was okay for then, but it got changed. And then a smaller room in the back. That's, that's the studio and more or less still there. All on grade. And we set out to build it. Here are some of the original drawings. I used to draw them at night in pencil. Okay. There's a section through it and you can see the ceiling sloping. That's the movie theater above. And you can see that we still kept some of the ideas of the curved walls, which were left over from the club. This is what Jimmy really wanted. So we start to build it. That's the entrance. That's all you saw from the street, which almost became a landmark. Unfortunately, got torn down about five years ago. But that was the original entrance. You just walk by, hit a buzzer, videos, boom, and they let you downstairs. It's still that way today. And uh, now I'm starting to get some other jobs. I got a house. You can see that I'm still quite influenced by all these curves. And we start building it. Now, the site's a pretty good site. Let's do a little acoustics here. The site was a good site then, and it's a good site now. Why? It's on the ground. It's, there's nothing below it. It's slab on grade. Very high ceilings. Massive concrete slab above it. So even though there was a theater above it, the weight and the load uh, of the theater made the concrete slab so thick that it almost had enough isolation from the theater without a hung lid uh, underneath it, which we installed anyway. Very few columns, really only two columns, right over here and here. We're looking this way, okay? And it was, a very, it was an ideal site for a studio. This would be a good site for a studio today. We put a little, like a, not a passenger elevator, but like an equipment elevator for loading off the street. So we start on what took about a year to build this studio. And to remember that there were no studio builders, nobody, we, we were in sort of uncharted territory here as far as getting it done. But we, we, we managed to get it done, a few mistakes, things done incorrectly, but it, it did manage to get finished. All this original ductwork, all this is above the hung, the suspended lid, which you'll see in a minute. Still all there, 40 years later, still there. Nothing's, ever, nothing's changed. So it took about a year to build, and it finally got finished. We have a few very old pictures from those days. That's more or less what the ceiling of the studio looked like and still looks like, and it was this sort of twisting flat propeller so that no surface was parallel to the wood floor and we used a, a kind of an air entrained plaster sort of a semi-absorbing plaster a lot of air in the plaster which still to this day seems to have really given the room a marvelous 
uh, orchestral sound, but still allows for separation. And then I'll oh, gobos. And you can see this lighting scheme. The picture's awful, but this was Jimmy's idea that, that the room could be theater. So this is a new idea for 1969, that the studio can become a theatrical experience. The studios were horrible places where musicians went. They did the work. You threw them out. Okay? And that was the concept. The artist is taking control. This was started out as his own personal studio. Of course, sadly enough, we, we know that he didn't get to spend too much time in it, but that was not the intent. Pardon me? Well, the floor is wood. Actually, we ended up with half of it being carpet, but in, in time it became all wood. So we want the plaster, which is reflective, although it had air particles in it, so it was pretty good for low frequency absorption. And I mean, one idea would be to put it on a slope. That would be an obvious way to eliminate flutter echo. But then we'd have a flat ceiling. Again, Jimmy always wanted curves, and that was the original theme and the original idea from the club. So I took that idea and said, well, why don't we put a propeller up there? OK, well, a true propeller would have, you'd have no room. You know, it would have been 10 feet deep. So we, it was like a flat propeller. And if you look carefully at it, you'll see it starts um, it just starts and winds on itself. So no surface is parallel, no piece of that ceiling is parallel to the floor. Okay, that was the, that was the concept. And then this curve kind of counterbalanced, there it is right here, and that counterbalanced this curve, which was coming out from the window. So the two curves, one curve and another curve, the inter two intersecting curves. There was really not a straight line in the place. I remember one day, we, we had about 15 doors here. All these doors are soundproof acoustic doors. And we put a little window in them so you don't kill yourself when you're swinging it. And we, we ordered what we thought was an economical door, to, to, you know, not that economical. And they were rectangular windows, sort of like the windows in the back of the room there. And I literally remember he came. Jimmy just arrived one afternoon unannounced. He looked at the door and he said, can we have round windows? Just like that. Actually, he didn't say, can we have round windows? He said, change them. And 15 to 20 doors found their ways into other projects in New York. By then, a few other studios were being built. The doors disappeared, and 20 doors with round windows appeared, some of which are still there. It's just how, it's just how he saw the world. It was kind of fascinating. And he was very quiet about announcing it. He just, you know kind of like his music. He just heard it and, and he played it. The black and white picture, I think, is always more exciting because it was white. The, base, the room is white. It's a white room and then the lights are what makes it change. And that's the smaller B room. That gives you an idea. No surface is parallel to the... To the uh... Now, please don't leave this lecture thinking that parallel surfaces are bad. That's actually not true. I can't tell you how many times I see that in books and I cringe. That's just not true. There's nothing wrong with parallel surfaces. 